So I'm really excited to introduce James Joe. Um, James is an assistant professor at Stanford um, in the Department of Biomedical Data Science and by courtesy computer science and electrical engineering. And um, his lab develops machine learning methods for understanding human health and disease. And in particular, they've made a lot of contributions in making machine learning models more reliable, accountable, and um, easier to interpret and human compatible. So several of his methods, uh, maybe some of the ones that he's gonna to talk today are, are being used by biotech and pharma companies. And um, James is the recipient of um, several different um, best paper awards and um, general awards in top um, CS and com computational biology venues, including a best paper award at Recom in 2019, NSF Career Award, Google Faculty Award, um, Tesla and AI Award, Amazon Research Award, and um, Sloan Fellowship, and many more. So we're very lucky to have James here, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Um, please take it away, James. Great. Thanks, Sarah, for the, for the invitation, for the introduction. It's very nice to meet all of you. Uh, we're very excited to be here and to uh, share with you some of the recent work that we've been doing. Uh, so for this presentation, um, I'll primarily be talking about some of the work that we've been doing on the more computer vision side. And the high level idea here is, can we actually use computer visions to really to deeply phenotype human diseases across different kinds of physical scales, right? From the level looking at even individual single cells to looking at tissues and physiological levels and to connect that with you know, genomics and other biomarker readouts. So to you know, maybe sort of set to the mood for the rest of the presentation, I, I would like all of us to do a little thought experiment together. All right, so I've written on the screen here, sort of a few standard descriptions of the face of a particular person. All right, so these are maybe the descriptions that you might find from, you know, from EHR or from sort of categorical features. Um, and I would like you to visualize as a part of this thought experiment, what you think the face of this person actually look like. So take a few th seconds to visualize based on the description I've written. Okay. So now I'm actually gonna show you the face, the, the, a photo of the face that I actually look what this person is. So you can see how, how, how closely you got it in your, in your visualization. Right, so this is the actual person. Okay. So it's actually a quite challenging task. Right? And when I ask my students or colleagues to do it, oftentimes you know, what they visualize can be very far off from what this actual person is. So this photo is actually interesting for a couple of reasons I'll explain, right? So the first, reason why I think this is an interesting photo is it's taken from a New England Journal study from a few years ago. It's actually at the photo of a truck driver, right? And you can see that the half of the, no, the face is actually asymmetric, right? So half the face, this half actually looks much older, you know, more wrinkled and sagging compared to this other half. And the reason is that because this is a truck driver, right? So half the face is actually exposed to the environment of the sun, right? Another half is facing inside into the truck. So it's quite a vivid illustration of just how much the environment and the genetics and biology of this person all interact together to inform his health status. The second reason why I thought this is actually a good illustration is I think it's quite a vivid demonstration of how much more information there is if we can actually carefully look at someone, if we can carefully look at some object, right, visually, compared to if we reduce that person, right, or object into a sort of standard no descriptions, either through language or through sort of categorical features, right? So maybe the standard description will have bytes or kilobytes of information, but the image itself, if we can carefully look at all the details, actually contains you know, gigabytes of information. So, so that's really sort of hopefully you know, some of the themes I will pick up on throughout the, the rest of the presentation. Now, this is already quite the clear through this example of the human face. And human face is something that's you know, relatively easy for us to look at, right? Because we're all very familiar with that. And I think this is even more so when we look at smaller scale objects that are really important for biomedicine, right? So if we look at individual single cells like I've shown here, like microglia, or if I look at tissue samples from cancer patients, right? So these are objects where there's a lot of very vivid, rich visual information, but we just simply do not really have a natural language to very precisely describe what these things are, right? In, using English or any other language that we have. We, we don't really have the right sort of vocabulary to really describe these, you know, what is this microglia doing, right? And I think that's really at the high level of where the promise of you know, computer vision in biomedicine is, come, 
coming in, right? It's, it's really a way to learn a new language, right? Off of the morphology, right? Of these different objects across these different scales. And then to connect that morphology language, right? With biomarkers, with readouts from genomics and to really teach us something insights about the biology and the health of these different objects. Um, and to sort of to illustrate some of this, I want to just go through a few vignettes, a few examples with you and um, of looking at this, applying this approach across a few different uh, physical scales, right? Because right? I think really the promise of this is, the power of this is you can actually do this sort of across multiple scales. So we'll look at things from the tissue level, at the single cell level, even at some sort of subcellular structures, and also at sort of the more physiological sort of levels of looking at organs. Right? And I'll think about how do we connect this with things like RNA sequencing and more, more genomic readouts. And if, if there's time in the end, I will talk about some actually quite more recent, very recent projects we've been working on, actually on how to use, uh, you know, make clinical trials more inclusive. So that, that would be sort of a fun bonus if there's more time in the end. Okay, so let me just start with sort of, uh, you know, with, with the first example, right, of how we can actually apply these computer vision techniques to really look at histopathology images in a new way and to actually teach us a lot about the genomics, right, from these kind of images. So a little bit of context, right? So these kind of histology images, right? Are, they're very routinely collected in all sorts of pathology labs. Right? So this in particular case is one from a breast cancer patient. So basically if you go into these pathology labs, right? So they will actually do these biopsies and they'll these collect these images that these are called H&E images. And oftentimes the clinicians would do sort of annotations of this image, right? So they would, there's a lot of information that's captured in the image. Right? So the clinician would be able to identify, for example, here, where are the tumor regions and where are the normal regions? Okay, so these are, are very routinely collected as a part of the clinical workflows. So in parallel, in the more last few years, right, there's also a lot more you know, very exciting progress on collecting genomics information, especially at sort of high resolution. So for example, single cell sequencing applied to these kinds of biopsies, right? So there the workflow would be, you take these biopsies, you first have to sort of dissolve the cells, and then you do sort of you know, high throughput genomic measurements like RNA sequencing. So as you can imagine, these two workflows actually have complementary strengths and weaknesses, right? So the strength of the histology workflow is that it's very visual, it's relatively inexpensive, and you can actually learn a lot of information, especially about the spatial arrangements of the tumor and tissue by looking at these biopsy images. The limitation is that the readouts you get is fairly low dimensional. Maybe you get tumor normal classifications, but you don't really get too much molecular information by looking at this. The advantage of the single cell analysis is, you know, it's very complementary. It's high dimensional readouts, right? You get information about many genes if you're doing RNA sequencing, but oftentimes you have to perturb the tissue. So you lose the, the geometry, the, the spatial information of where the cells are coming from, right? So you lose the spatial range arrangements. And so that's really the motivation for, for our work, which is, you know, can we actually use computer vision as a way to get to the best of both worlds, right? So that we will have still retain the spatial information from the images, right? but teach the algorithms to learn also about all of the genomic readouts that you would get from, from sequencing kind of experiments, right? So the, we developed an algorithm STNet, right? So I'll just tell you briefly what it does first, and then I'll come back and describe more of how it does it, right? So what STNet does is basically it's performing kind of an image to image translation, right? So it takes its input, these kind of standard histopathology images, so HIE stained images, and it translates this image into hundreds of new images. Each new image corresponds to the spatially resolved expression profile of a different gene of interest. So that's, that's, let's say if you're interested in this breast cancer growth factor FASN, right? The algorithm actually reads this HNE image and then translates that into, generates a new image corresponding to the expression profile for FASN. So the yellow regions are where it's highly expressed, blue are where it's lowly expressed. If you're interested in a different gene, maybe it's collagen marker, as a more architectural of the tissue, then it, the algorithm also generates a new image corresponds to the spatially resolved expression profile for, for FASN, or for, for this collagen marker. All right, so this is all done based on just from the, H, the histology image without any other information. All right, and we have also done experiments at actual spatial transcriptome sequencing experiments to validate that the computationally generated images of the expression profiles, right, 
by the algorithm matches up very closely quite well with these experimental measurements. And we can do this now, uh, generate accurate spatial expressions just from the HNA image for about a few hundred, a couple hundred genes. Okay, and this also works well across other kinds of patients. Right? If you have a new patient sample, a new histology image, then we'll generate sort of new expression profiles. And this is uh, published in a paper uh, last year um, in, in Nature Biomedical Engineering. Okay, so let me now come back and describe a little bit more detail. You know, what is the data that we use to train and to validate these models and how does this actually work? And also feel free to ask questions. Uh, I know there are also students here, so please ask, stop me if there's anything that's not clear to you. So the technology that's used to generate, experimentally measure these kind of data is called spatial transcriptome. Right? It's also recently commercialized by 10X under this VCM platform. So in a nutshell, so this is developed by my collaborator, Joachim Lundberg, and the work is led by uh, Brian, who is a terrific PhD student at Stanford working in my group. So, so Yocom had this really great idea of using these chips, right? So here's how it works in a nutshell, right? So you basically have this chip here, right? So you see this little dot on the chip. So each dot actually corresponds to a set of probes. So when I take a biopsy tissue, I just simply overlay that on top of the chip, right? And here's like a cross-sectional view of it. Here's the tissue and here are the probes. And each column of probes is barcoded with its XY location, tell, telling me where it's located. Right. And when I put the tissue on top of the probe, right, so the probes actually penetrate into the cells. And when a probe encounters a transcript, it attaches this XY barcode on top of the transcript. So that when we do the sequencing, I know where each transcript is coming from. Right. So that's how we generate the experimental measurements for the spatial expression profile. So a really neat idea from Yocom. Um, so we generated, I think, one of the largest prof uh, atlas of these spatial transcriptal measurements for breast cancer. Right, um, and this is with the data that we use to train to develop this model to do this image to image translation that we call STNet, right? And in a nutshell, what the algorithm is doing is that it's, you know, it's looking at this input histology image. So each image is actually very large, right? So there's, you know, they're much larger than the kinds of images you usually find on, on your phone or on ImageNet. Right, and that enables us to sort of zoom in into each of the patches, right? So each little patch here, right, each grid is roughly about you know, 100 to 150 microns in, um, in, in uh, area, in size, right? So you can make out quite a bit of information. You can, for example, you can see where the nuclei are, and you can see there are sort of the local architectures of these cells, a lot of the geometries of the morphologies. Right, so that's basically what the algorithm is trying to learn to look at to infer the expression patterns of different genes of interest, right? And the algorithm uh, is basically a particular kind of convolutional architecture, right? So it's basically scanning across each of these local patches to look for this morphological information. It learns a way to essentially represent this in sort of like a representation that captures the morphology, right? And then based on that representation and basically use that information to say, okay, based on the cells and their geometries that I've seen here, right? What's the expression value for pat for Patson locally? What's the expression for these other genes, right? So it does this for several hundred genes. So James, um, quickly, so how do you know which genes you want to probe? How did you determine um, which set of 100? That's right, yeah, quick question. So the experimental measurement is actually fairly uh, unbiased in that it's able to measure a lot of different genes, right? And I'll come back and say, so we did develop this model to try to uh, infer the expressions for maybe the most highly expressed genes, because right? that's the ones that will actually have the, the, the most data. And, and I'll come back and describe a little bit more. So these highly expressed genes also ends up capturing most of the key, many of the key you know, immune response genes and also tumor markers as well, some of the key uh, architectural genes for cell for the cellular tissue architectures. I have a question if you don't mind. Yes, please. Uh, so I just wanted to ask if the, so the grid resolution that you use for those chips, um, like what, how was, was it determined, um, like how small they get and what kind of resolution you need? And is that, is the resolution, like the, the amount of the, like how small the, those grids are, does that, did you have to figure out the right amount in order to be, valid for clinical diagnostics? Good question. Um, so the resolution here experimentally is really limited by how 
finally we can space these probes. Mm. So basically, you know, each column is a, a large number of small probes and then corresponds to basically like 100, about 100 microns. Mm. That's sort of what determines the experimental resolution. Mm. I'll actually show you in a few slides of how we can actually use computation, use machine learning algorithms to do super computational super resolution. What I mean is that even though the experimental measurements about 100 microns, we can actually computationally super resolve to, to be ah. some standard resolution. Ah, okay, thank you. Yeah, good question. Okay, so this is actually also related to, to the, some of the previous questions, right? Um, so we developed this model, right, on the, our breast cancer data sets. And it turned out that you know, 10X genomics quite fortuitously had also generated their own data. So these are different patients down using sort of different imaging platforms, also slightly differences in how they do the sequencing. So it's really quite a different data set. Um, and then we sort of took our algorithm and we shifted to 10X, so no tuning of any hyperparameters. Um, and we're actually very happy to see the algorithm really worked quite well on the 10X external data. Right? So here's just one example where the XY axis corresponds to the AUC of the algorithm on two different external data sets from 10X. Each dot is basically one gene, right? So this is basically measuring how well does our computationally generated spatial expression profile match up when 10X did their own experiments to measure the spatial transcription profile. If it's AUC, it's it's an ROC curve that you're doing the area under, and what's the what's the label? Yes, yeah. So so here we for this particular metric, we actually just did a threshold to see whether it's highly expressed or lowly expressed at a particular location. I see. So you're not pred predicting spatial location; you're predicting expression level. Right. So the output is actually um, a spatially resolved prediction for. At, you know, at this location, whether this gene is highly or lowly expressed. Got it. Thanks. Yes. We also have a regression measurement actually to predict the actual expression values. And then, and so we're, I guess we're particularly excited about these genes at sort of the top right corner. So this cluster of genes are the ones where we could actually do quite accurate imputation for, right? Just based on the images itself. And these are the genes that actually captures many of the key tumor markers as well as key immune markers. Right, so these are, in some sense, the genes that are the easiest for the algorithms to learn just based on the morphologies of what expressions actually look like. And it's also nice to get that we're capable to capture maybe many of the key mobility and architectural genes. James, I'm sorry if, I, if you already said that and I missed it. How many genes are actually measured on the um, end? Uh... Yeah, so the, the spatial transcriptal measurements can, in principle, measure thousands of genes in parallel. Um, so there, one of the limitations really just sort of the depths of sequencing uh, and many of the genes are just very lowly expressed or very lowly captured by the probes, right? So we, we do believe that, and we're, right now we're actually also pushing this to do more higher quality sequencing that we can actually push this to be several hundred genes that we could capture uh, and train the algorithms for. I have a question. Please. Um, how did you uh, decide on the threshold for uh, the 100 genes? As in, like, did you choose a threshold and then interesting genes happen to be above that threshold? Or was there any tumor? Yeah, so, yeah, so here we just have some very simple thresholds just based on their expression levels. Uh, if it's too lowly expressed, then we just don't have enough probes to, to, to detect them. So it's really just based on their expression levels. Thank you. Thanks. So here's sort of a, a, you know, another more zoomed in view of what this look, will look like, right? So each square here is basically about hundred microns uh, in, uh, in length, right? Um, and the algorithm is able to sort of predict, right? So for, again, for this example gene, FASM, which is a tumor marker of interest, is able to detect, okay, so where is it, this gene are, is likely to be the most highly expressed. And is, in this particular case, it identifies that, oh, it's, it's it's these enlarged nuclei, right, uh, where FASM is sort of the signature, morphological signature for this tumor marker FASM, which also agrees with some of our previous uh, literature on this. So the nice thing about this is that now we have this, you can actually do kind of a nice, um, you know, phenotype, let's say morphology to expression association kind of analysis in the native context of the tissue. Right. So you can see that for each of the genes, and FASM or many of the other genes, 
right? How does the expression of that gene actually really, really relate to different morphological features like the size of the nuclei, the axis which is like the elongation of nuclei in sort of the original tissue context, right? So you don't have to sort of dissolve the cells and take them out and perturb the cells. Uh, so we just started to do a few of these, right? I think this could open the door to a lot of interesting kind of phenotype association studies in these actual tumor tissues. Um, so the other thing we're super excited about is really thinking about how do we really go beyond the experimental uh, measurement limitations, right? So this is work that's led by, again, by my collaborator, Yukon Blomberg. Um, and here the idea is that you can actually combine the morphology images from the HNE image itself, right, with some of the coarse spatial transcriptal measurements and to do computational super resolution. So here's just a demo of this, right? So on the first row is really the raw, you know, spatial transcriptal measurements. You can see these are, the measurement outcomes are sort of pixelated grids, right? So that's because that's the limitation of these 150 microns, you know, here's just showing a couple of genes. Um, and by combining this where it was the actual image itself, right? So the algorithm is able to actually infer at a much higher resolution, right? Uh, where the expression, the spatial result expressions of these individual genes. Right, so here are some zoomed in versions of this. And for each of the specific genes of interest, we could actually do sort of you know, much more low throughput kind of in situ hybridization methods to validate that the computational super resolutions actually matches up well with experimental resolutions. Right. So this is, I think, so potentially one of the interesting areas going forward is to really use the computation as a way to super resolve the spatial measurements. Right. And this is all possible because there is a lot of really fine grained morphological features in the tissue images itself that tells us about the expressions of different genes of interest. Certainly not for all the genes, right? So maybe it would be hard to detect different transcription factors, but certainly for many of these other genes, there's enough information there. And the other interesting direction of this, we've been applying this to, you know, to archival images, right? Because to train the algorithm, it took a lot of new data, but once you, we have the algorithm, all that we need are just images, which everyone has. Right, so there's, for example, a lot of images from the TCGA, from different clinical labs, they have these kind of HNE images. And we have some demonstration that we can apply these algorithms to, the, to these archival images to generate spatially resolved expression profiles, right? And once we have those profiles, then we can quantify things like you know, tumor heterogeneity, how much are the immune genes, the immune cells interacting with different tumor cells, right? So these are all things that are of interest, um, both clinically and biologically. So the ultimate goal here that we're trying to go towards is to really build kind of like, a, you know, like an Instagram type thing for pathology, right? So that you can just put this input, these kind of histology images, and the algorithm would generate kind of filters, computational filters like you have on Instagram, except that here the filters would basically correspond to the different spatial resolved transcriptomes right, for different genes of interest. And if we can do this reliably, right, this would be you know, basically instantaneous and then it can help things like prognosis and also treatment design, especially related to, uh, to different you know, tumor heterogeneities. As, as we saw, it can also open up sort of new linkages between the morphologies of cells as well as the genetic you know, spatial resolved gene expression. I have a question about that. How commonplace is it now for spatial transcriptomics uh, to uh, change a prognosis or a treatment design in a clinical setting? I think it's still a very much early stage. Um, I think especially for many of the um, immuno-oncology kind of treatments that people are very interested in exploring you know, to fully leverage like, things like tumor heterogeneity as ways to do treatment recommendations, but it's certainly very much early stage. I, I just wanna make sure I'm understanding what you're, what you're showing. So you've trained the model on actual transcriptomes from known image data that you've overlaid and you've been able to get the gene the genes yes but now you're saying given that training we can take this image we don't need any transcriptomes for this sample yes and you can then predict that's right wow okay and new images so that's actually the test we did with 10x right so they we only we only took images from them we generated the spatial transcriptome profiles and then we compare that with the experimental data that they, that they did independently to measure those profiles. Okay, cool. So 
Now I want to sort of push these kind of similar ideas forward a little bit more, right? So here we're able to, previously we were able to capture these kind of leverage the spatial morphologies, right? Now can we actually also capture more like even spatial and temporal morphologies, right? So this is sort of a, a quite recent project is a collaboration with Shaolin and Tom. Tom is at UCSF and Shaolin at Chen Zuckerberg Biohub. Uh, its work is led by my student, Michael, who's like a really excellent PhD student here at Stanford. And the idea here is to really, you know, we want to apply similar kinds of computer vision algorithms, but also to bring the temporal components into it, right? So here's an example of the kinds of data that we're working with. These are uh, label-free microscopy videos of microglia, right? Uh, you know, taking over 24 hours. And Michael developed like a really nice pipeline, right? So you just to segment to follow each of the microglia around, right? So the upshot of, of, of all of this is that you can just imagine you have basically like have a private eye that follows and monitors each of these individual microglia as it's, as it's walking around and interacting with its neighbors, right? So for example, if you have, you know, here's just one example, right? This in the red box, here's a zoom, zoomed in version of it. You can see this microglia, it has all sorts of interesting behaviors. Maybe it's even interacting with some of the neurons. And you can see this neighbor, this other red box, the zoom in is also having various interactions. You can even make out some of the subcellular compartments. Right, so what's really fascinating is that you know, these microglia, you know, they have very interesting behaviors. They have very interesting social life, right? They have to interact with different neighbors. And that's really what we want to capture. These are these high resolution, fine grained profile dynamics. And we want to connect that with also with their transcriptome changes. So Michael, to do this, right, so this is where we run into this question that I mentioned before, we just don't really have the right language to really describe, you know, what, what this thing is behaving like, right? So how would I even describe this precisely? So this is where the computer vision can be very helpful is the first to teach us what is the right morph you know, vocabulary to think about the morphal dynamics. All right, so Michael developed a really nice system, right? There's a particular kinds of you know, variational autoencoder um, and what's it, effectively what it does is that it takes this, the individual videos sort of the individual microglia, right? And the, each of the videos basically corresponds to essentially a trajectory or a path in this learned representation space, which is basically the latent space of this autoencoder, of the variational autoencoder, right? So here I'm showing you sort of four example microglia, right? In different colors, right? And then you can actually see that each of those corresponds to a different trajectory, a different path in this learned morphology space, right? So this learned morphology space is really the natural language that we want to use to describe the behaviors, the morphology changes of these cells, of the individual cells, right? So sometimes you see this you know, interactions which also corresponds to these large jumps in this morphology space. Okay, so here's one demonstration of something you know, that we thought was quite interesting is that when I look at this morphology space, which is all learned from the data, right? Um, and it turns out that among these particular population of microglia, there are basically a large two different, broadly speaking, two large groups of morphodynamic behaviors, right? So you have, I color coded them to be blue and red or state one and two. And here's sort of two examples of these large broad categories of morphologies, right? So in the blue state, right, uh, these are, you can you know, here's, here's an example of what these cell look like, right? So these are sort of, almost like couch potatoes that are sort of large. They move very quite slowly and they don't move around or interact very much, right? Um, and then sort of more, uh, and then in the red cell, right? In the red state, you have these much more activated microglia cells, right? Who are interacting with their neighbors, right? And then what's nice is that we can also capture sort of transitions between these two different morphodynamic states. Right? So sometimes the cells would move across them. Um, and when we actually do sort of RNA, single cell RNA sequencing, right, in this around the same population of microglia, we also find that there are also two, broadly speaking, so two uh, transcriptome states, right? So I color coded them to be blue and red just to make the match the correspondence easier for us to visualize. And to validate this correspondence, what we can do is actually do various experimental perturbations, right? So for example, if we do a particular type of perturbation, right, maybe it's interferon beta, and we find that a lot of the microglia basically transition into more of this blue state. And similarly in this transcriptome state, right, all of them basically collapse and transition into this particular subcluster in this expression space. Uh, and then by just doing sy systematic sort of external perturbations like this, right, 
to verify different orthogonal states, then we can, that's how we can kind of validate the, cor the correspondence between the transcriptome and the clusters and the morphodynamic states. So this is, again, still a sort of ongoing work, uh, relatively early stage on on ongoing work, but we're very excited about sort of the potential of this as a way to really capture these morphodynamic transitions and, and dynamics really, and how that changes with, so associates with dynamics in the transcriptome states of, at the single cell individual cell level. James, can I just uh, clarify a question? I'm sorry, yes. I'm confused. The, can you just explain in the two figures, does each dot correspond, for instance, on the left to a feature and on the right to a gene or, are, or what are the dots? Yes, so good question. So each dot here basically corresponds to basically one cell. It is one cell, okay. Yeah, so um, we identify sort of two clusters. Um, yeah, yeah, both in the morphology space and also- So then the, the, the idea is that those two states in the two different UMAPs correspond to each other in some sense. Exactly. Are, are, you, are you going further to try to map individual cells to each other or just at the state level? Yeah, so, so far we validated the state correspondence by doing these different orthogonal perturbations, like in different beta perturbations. We are actually actively working on doing the single cell mapping as well. So there are the ideas to just, you know, we capture these cells, everything's automated. So we capture these cells, we pick them up and then actually sequence them at different interesting points of their transitions to do the single cell matching. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Okay. So, so the third example I want to mention more briefly is actually, it turns out that you know, similar kinds of algorithms that we're talking about here can also allow, allow us to really study things at the organ level or so physiological level that's, um, the, and teach us actually there's a lot of interesting things we can learn by looking at that very carefully, right? So this is um, a paper that we published in Nature last year, which is where we developed uh, this kind of similar video-based algorithm to really assess and to look at the morphologies of from cardiac ultrasound and to learn a lot of information about both the heart conditions as well as functionings of other organs like the kidney, liver, et cetera. So the work is led by David, who is a former postdoc. And he's actually a cardiologist in the group. So the, the context for this is that you know, the heart disease is really still the leading cause of death in the US. You know, it's responsible for one in four mortalities um, in this country. And you know, these kind of cardiac ultrasounds, like what the one I have shown here, it's called echocardiogram, it's, really well, it's one of the most uh, commonly used ways to assess how well the heart is functioning. Right? So there's tens of millions of these ultrasounds done every year in the US, and they're actually not cheap. So each one will cost, let's say, you know, about $1,000 on average. So here's four examples from four different patients at Stanford of what these ultrasounds will look like. Right? So, did, did, all right, so now, in a nutshell, what the cardiologists are looking at is that a lot of this assessment is done sort of through their manual human vision, right? So what they would do is that they would actually look at the chamber of the heart here. They would actually go through this video and try to identify the frame where the heart is the largest, when the chamber is most expanded, and the frame where it's most contracted, right? So they'll find those two individual frames and they will actually trace out the boundaries of the heart chamber. So why did they do that? Because if you view the heart as basically like a, you know, a, a power pump, and if you want to assess how much the power the pump is generating, you want to measure how much contraction is producing. Right? So that's why they find the largest and smallest frame and do all the manual tracings. You can imagine this process is actually very time, you know, very expensive and also time consuming, right? And it's also hugely variable because you have to find the individual frames by eye and uh, do the tracings by hand and then do the calculations. And this is actually what's done you know, tens of millions of time every year in, in the US and hundreds of millions of time the, across the world. Um, so we thought, okay, so this process is fairly labor intensive, right? So can we actually use actually very similar kinds of algorithm that I showed to study the cellular morphodynamics? Can we actually use that here to study the morphodynamics of the heart, right? To, and to automate many different parts of this process. So that's what we did in this, in the nature paper. And this is basically the algorithm, right? So what it does is that here's, it takes its input, these very commonly used ultrasound videos of the heart, right? Uh, and then it actually generates Here's the output edge, does sort of automatic segmentations and trackings of this chamber of the heart. And it produces in real time, like assessment of how much power the heart is generating as well as various other metrics, like ejection fraction. I won't go into too much detail of the algorithm itself, 
but just to really convey sort of the high level insights you know, of how we design these kind of structures. Right, so the idea here is that you know, the image itself, the video itself here, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a video. Right? So here we want to use sort of capture both the spatial and temporal dynamics. Right? So we use the particular kinds of spatial temporal convolution that captures both kind of patterns. And then that's what the top arm is doing. And the bottom arm has sort of basically doing like a attention-based segmentation of the relevant chamber of the heart. And the high level insight, the, the intuition for doing this is that we want to focus the attention of the model on the right, you know, on the more relevant physiological parts of the, of, of the organ, right? And the output of this will be assessments of ejection fraction, uh, as well as actually for, you can learn also about things like the liver conditions, kidney, uh, other laboratory values just by, the, by assessing the heart videos. Right, so this is also being uh, deployed, uh, developed and deployed now. Um, we, it, it, so one thing we did is to see how well did it work across other hospitals. The data was trained at Stanford and worked quite well at Stanford. And then we shipped the algorithm without, also without tuning any parameters and shipped it to a different hospital at Cedars. And they were also quite happy to see that you know, at this different setting, even though there are different systems and differences in how people collect the, the data and process the data, the algorithm basically worked essentially as well as it did at Stanford. So that gave us some confidence that we could then sure deploy this across a variety of different conditions. In, in case you're interested in this, we also actually made all of this data publicly available. So I think this is right now maybe one of the larger or the, the largest publicly available medical video data sets, right? So we have over 10,000 patients at Stanford, each of them will have these ultrasound videos as well as their different medical annotations and outcomes. So all of this is available now if you're interested to, to play, play around more with this resource. Hopefully it will be a resource both for the machine learning people who want to work with videos and also for the medical communities um, who, who are interested in these deployment problems. I have a question if you don't mind, or I have a couple of questions. Yes, please go ahead. Um, so my first question is if this algorithm or if this can handle um, arrhythmias and skipped beats or noise like that, um, and uh, if it works just as well with, with um, you know, irregular heartbeats. Uh, and then my second question was going to be, if you think that um, this kind of model uh, has the potential to, uh, to characterize the system of like the heart to where maybe like a compu uh, computational fluid dynamics model could be built or some kind of structural model to like look for um, or to to uh, to help with the tracking and diagnosis of things like um, uh, dilated uh, aneurysms um, in the heart. And so I was just curious if you see any application of, of the computer vision to actually like building some kind of um, engineering model that could be used for interventions. Yeah, thanks. Both are very good questions. Mm -hmm. So the goal of this model is to really to mimic and, and to automate many different parts of the existing cardiology workflow that's quite mm -hmm. manual and time consuming, right? It's all mm -hmm. these segmentation and identification parts. That's, that's what the initial goal of the, what this model is designed to do. Mm -hmm. And it is able to capture things like the skip beats and rhythmia and some of the more challenging conditions. We actually did a prospective study where we took some of the harder cases Right. Uh, and then have both the algorithms evaluate those cases, also have a panel of five experienced cardiologists evaluate those cases. Mm. Right. And, and there we were able to show that the algorithm actually matched up very well with, with what the expert panels did in these perceptive studies. Mm. And then the, the, la the second question you asked is also very interesting. Um, so I do think that there's a lot of information that, that are present in, in these videos. Mm -hmm. right? So for example, you do actually just by looking at the face and the intensity of these different parts, right, you actually you do learn a lot of information that I think are very relevant for the, the mechanics um, and the fluid mechanics of, of the heart, right? Even you can learn information about, about um, uh, blood biomarkers from this. Mm -hmm. So what, one thing we showed is that we can actually take these videos and predict various things that are measured based on uh, blood-based laboratory values. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had the idea just because, um, like, I had I had spoken with uh, Allison Marsden at Stanford before, yes. and she does CFD models of the heart and hemodynamics. So that's why I was just curious if there might be some potential to bridge um, this stage or technology like this with something at that stage. So 
Um, yeah, thank you yeah. For I think that's a really interesting direction. Yes. Yeah. I've talked with Allison a little bit before, but I think that's certainly an interesting direction of follow up. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Hope it gives people a sense of how we could actually use some of these more recent computer vision algorithms to do quite careful and high resolution phenotyping right, across different physical scales from the cellular to tissue to organ level. And I think really the power here is by looking at these morphologies right, and the dynamics, there's a lot of information that we can then connect with other biomarkers and genomics and transcriptome that can all come back, come together to, you know, to inform the, the health disease status of the patient. So I'll also pause here for a little bit to see if people have any more questions before I move on to the sort of the bonus parts of the, of the presentation. Okay, yeah, so I think there's been a lot of good questions already. So maybe I'll talk, go forward a little bit more and then we can stop again to wrap up at the end. Okay, so the, the last part I want to mention, um, you know, I thought it'd be fun. So even if it's sort of a slightly different topic, I thought it'd be fun to mention it. Uh, just because it's sort of like a very recent work that we're quite excited about. Uh, we just published it uh, just earlier this month. Um, it's a paper in Nature. And the high level idea here is basically using AI to make you know, clinical trials more inclusive. Right? Um, just to give you a little bit of context, right? So if you think about this whole translational process from all the basic research that we do, right, to actually taking it to the patients and de de to deployment, Really, the clinical trial stage is oftentimes the biggest bottleneck from this whole translation pipeline, right? Each clinical trial can often cost billions of dollars. And one of the reasons why trials are so expensive is because it's actually quite difficult to find the right patients to enroll in these trials, right? So how each clinical trial work is, uh, is that each trial will actually set up, you know, there'll be a hundreds of pages of PDF, right? And they will have very precise descriptions of which patients they want to exclude from ever participating in these trials. Right. Um, and the high level goal of this, you know, of this paper is see, can we actually use real world data and algorithms right, to make this, to help us to design these clinical trials? And the upshot of this is that we, we found that we can actually make the clinical trials much more inclusive sorry, so that many of the patients that were previously excluded because they're not eligible would actually be able to participate in these trials while still maintaining the safety and the efficacy of these trials. Right. So that's basically the, the high level pitch of the paper. The work is led by Rish Young, who is a really amazing PhD student in my group. And we actually developed a product, Trial Pathfinder, which is being deployed uh, and being piloted now at Roche Genentech to help them to design their trials. Uh, the collaboration is, is also a collaboration with, with colleagues at Genentech. So to give you a little bit more broader context and motivation for this, right? So as I mentioned, really, restrictive eligibility criteria to clinical trials, especially for oncology trials, is really one of the biggest barriers. There's something like 40% you know, of all oncology trials actually fail because they fail to reach the minimum enrollment requirements. Another reason is that even among the 60% of trials that you know, do enroll enough patients, because they're so restrictive of these eligibility conditions, right, the trial cohorts, i.e. the patients who participate in the clinical trials, are so narrow that they don't really reflect the real world population, right? So what that means is that even the results you get right, from these trials, oftentimes they don't really generalize very well to the real world population of people who end up taking the drugs after it comes on the market, right? So people in, from the machine learning background, this is sort of clearly like a domain adaptation type, generalization type of issues. So wh why, is it ha why does this happen, right? So how do people design these, eligibility criteria, how did it end up being so restrictive? So it turned out that the current practice for designing which patients are eligible to even participate in the trials ends up being very anecdotal um, and certainly not very much data-driven. Right, so here's the actual real example, right, from a real trial, right? So oftentimes what people do is that, right, if you want to design a new trial, they'll see, okay, so what was the previous trial that was just most similar, right? So then they'll copy over the template, which could be hundreds of pages of PDF, and then based on that template, they'll go through and see, okay, can we modify some of the particular criteria right, based on their experience, which is often a little bit more anecdotal. Right, so here's what actually really happens, right? So for example, these are specific conditions that are used to exclude patients. These are based on certain laboratory values. And you can see that uh, what people would say is, okay, so for example, can they will ask, can you actually, someone ask, can you change this threshold from 1500 to 1000? 
right? And then somebody else would say, oh, we had to use 1500, just be consistent with the previous protocol, right? And then you know, there'll be a little bit back and forth. Uh, and then for hemoglobin, there'll be a similar discussion, right? Someone asked, can we change the nine to eight, right? There's no very recent um, data-driven, you know, data evidence for this. And then they will say, okay, well, we used nine before, let's keep using nine. And right, so a lot of the discussions are based really based on quite anecdotal discussions. And the upshot of this is that if you actually look across different clinical trials, right, it ends up using very different thresholds and also very different eligibility conditions. So here are O10, each row here is, is an individual clinical trials looking for a, a, a treatment in advanced lung, small cell lung cancer. Right. So you have 10 different trials and each column is one of the commonly used rules with which people can use to exclude patients. Yellow here means that this particular trial actually deployed that rule to exclude patients. Gray means that it did not use that. Right. So you can even see that even among different trials across these different trials within the same the disease area, they use very different combinations of these conditions with which to exclude or include patients. Right. And a lot of that really just because people didn't have a lot of data to really see how, how would you decide this, how do you make this more standard, more uniform. Right. And without a lot of data, that ends up oftentimes ends up being fairly arbitrary and also being quite restrictive so that they're, they're on the side of just excluding more and more patients. Okay, so hopefully the problem makes sense. Right. So, so in a nutshell, so we developed this approach called Trough Pathfinder, right, that uses this combination of real-world data to design, help us to design these eligibility criteria. So I just want to quickly give you the intuition without going into the details which are in the paper. Right, so the idea here is that, okay, in the ideal world, right, what I would do is that I would perform a whole bunch of different counterfactual experiments, right, so for each trial, you know, in the ideal world, I would run this trial a bunch of times in parallel using different eligibility conditions, and see, okay, so how did each of those runs work out, right? So can we actually relax some of these conditions and still make sure the trial is successful and patients are safe, right? Of course, that's not realistic because I only get to run each trial once and I can't go back in time and redo these counterfactuals. But I do have a lot of data. That's what we call the real world data, which is basically data of cancer patients who ends up taking this drug, who ended up taking this treatment after it comes on the market, right? So this real world data comes from electronic health records, and we use the flat iron data, which has EHR data from over 200 cancer clinics from around the country. So it has over, you know, hundreds of thousands of cancer patients. Um, and it turns out that you know, many of the cancer patients end up taking the drug, even if they were not eligible to participate in the clinical trial that approved the drug in the first place, right? because the, you know, there are all sorts of reasons why drugs can be, can be prescribed. Uh, so we use that data to essentially to do a lot of counterfactual analysis, right? So basically for each trial, right, we take all of these PDF, which are in free text, right? We encode that into a programmatic statement. We encode the eligibility rules, especially into these programmatic statements. And then we use this real world data to basically simulate a, a clinical trial, right? Um, and we can do various things that, uh, using different techniques to correct for different confounders. And then we also can evaluate the outcome of this synthetic clinical trial for the hazard ratio of the patients, right? So that just evaluates how effective the treatment is in this synthetic cohort. The power of this is now, now, we, we, now we could actually do this counterfactuals not just once, but millions of times, right? And what we do is that we actually do this analysis um, for each of the actual trials, right? People run, we actually generate thousands, thousands of synthetic trials uh, each one has a different sort of slightly different eligibility criteria, maybe with different rules or different thresholds. Uh, when we see, okay, on that synthetic cohort, how well did that drug work, right? And how did that, what was the trial outcome, right? And based on all of this, we can summarize the contributions of each of the eligibility rules using Shapley value to, to quantify how much did that particular eligibility condition contribute to the final success of the trial. And by success, I mean, you know, how, how, how well did the drug work in that trial? And also how many patients were enrolled in the trial? Right, so here's just one example. So bilirubin is one of the commonly used thresholds to exclude patients. Right, different drugs, different trials have different thresholds for bilirubin. Right? Uh, and what we are able to do now is to see, okay, so 
we can do this counterfactual analysis right, for different thresholds of bilirubin and see, okay, so if I use different thresholds of bilirubin to exclude patients, right, and then in my real world data, right, when I do these synthetic trials, how did the, the outcome of the trial change? Right? Can I ask you a question real quick? Do you have any information on side effects? We do. Um, yeah. That could, you know, modify yeah. uh, which, which rules are, you know, effective and which ones aren't? Yes, we do. Yeah, so we also have data on sort of the average events for this real world population. Yes. So basically what we do then, exactly, so that's a good point. So exactly, so we do is that for each of the actual trials, right, each of these lines, we then do, do this counterfactual analysis um, by computationally relaxing the bilirubin thresholds, right? And we can see that we can relax them, you know, to, to be broader, to be less res restrictive and still maintaining sort of the, the hazard ratio of the trial, right? So it's still effective while still maintaining also the safety standards so there's no more adverse events, right? And this can be done you know, systematically for all these other laboratory values, right? So the upshot of all of this is that, you know, we propose a set of data-driven criteria now, right? I think can potentially help the clinical trials to in terms of how they design this. And the benefit of data-driven criteria is that it really oftentimes uh, on average more than doubles the number of eligible patients while still reducing the hazards of the trials, right? So you end up having sort of lower hazard ratios. So this suggests that actually many of the patients that were excluded from the trials before, especially many women, more minorities, elder patients would have benefited from these trials to the same or even greater extent as the, patient, as, as the more narrow populations that were eligible. Um, yeah, so, so this is just like, a, uh, you know, there I think we're super excited about different ways to take this forward. I mean, I think the general insight here is that, you know, by combining algorithms with these real world data from EHR, right, we think we can make clinical trials much more efficient and more inclusive. And here we focus on cancer, on oncology, but I think the similar insights can be, and algorithms can be used for other drugs and other diseases. And we're also, uh, as I mentioned, actively deploying this to guide the designs of new prospective trials uh, uh, at Roche. Okay, so I'll just conclude here. Um, so here are the references for all of the work that I described. So the data and the codes, the papers and codes are all available on our website. I just want to thank again the students that led each of these works. So yeah, happy to, to have more questions and discussions. Thank you so much, James, for the wonderful talk. Yeah, we have a few minutes for questions. So I, I have a quick question. So in the last part, AI to design inclusive um, clinical trials. So you mentioned the Shapley values and how can you elaborate on, I missed the part, how you use it. Yes. So you want to find features that are important and then how does it, um, yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Yeah. So this is a little bit different from the standard kind of Shapley value C machine learning or the data Shapley value. So here yeah. we're thinking about, you have a bunch of eligibility conditions that this that defines which, um, which let me go back to an example, uh, that you know, the, all of these are rules, right? Uh, based on different laboratory values or previous treatments that decide which patients are eligible for a particular trial, right? And for each of these rules, essentially we run different, you know, for each of the trials, we run a large number of different uh, synthetic clinical trials. Each synthetic trial actually uses a different combination of these different uh, eligibility conditions just to see what would happen, right? And then the Shapley values is used to summarize what is the overall contribution, the effect of each of these each of these uh, conditions. So, for example, exclusions based on hemoglobin, right? So, how did that exclusion condition contribute across across all of these different tr synthetic trials, right? So, it ends up being having a score that says, okay, so hemoglobin. Is ends up being you know, not so useful for for protecting the for reducing the hazard ratio of the trials. Right. So it's a follow-up question. So that helps you modify your eligibility criteria. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that's how we end up deciding how to what how, which partition to re recommend and how we do that is very simple. We just simply pick everything that have larger than zero Shapley values. Do you account for uh, correlation between features? because yes. that is very important here. That's right, yeah. So that's a good question. So there could be lots of interactions between these different laboratory values, 
right? Which is actually why we thought this this the framework that I described is actually good for capturing these kinds of interactions, right? Because since we're actually running not just one trial, not one synthetic trial, but millions or thousands of different synthetic trials, each one uses a different combination of these different features, different criteria, then we can actually capture what is the effect of changing each of the criteria under different contexts. Okay, and another question. Um, what did you find out? Uh, what were the major region, reasons uh, like previously, uh, which factors were contributing to exclusion of the minority or like population that you describe that you're improving using AI? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, th I think overall, it's actually a lot of the laboratory based thresholds. Right? So people would you know, take laboratory, they do these laboratory testing, right, for hemoglobin, platelets, cons, and they will set different thresholds to say, okay, if your values are below the thresholds, then you're excluded, you cannot participate in the trials. So I think that's actually one big area where we find that there's potentially a lot of patients are being excluded, especially the more older or women or minority patients are being excluded um, without, I think, too much good justifications, right? Because in our data, we show that we could actually relax these thresholds, right? Sometimes quite substantially um, and have a lot more patients enrolled in, in these trials. I mean, the other way to look at this is that even if I look at existing companies, right? Different biopharma companies, oftentimes they use different threshold values, right? Some of them use 1.5, others use one. And if you ask them, why did you pick these different thresholds? They oftentimes they don't have a great reason except to say that's how they did it before. Um, here we are providing evidence that you can, you know, you can standardize these different thresholds to be the more relaxed ones, like 1.5, that would have the benefit of making the trials more inclusive while still protecting the safety of these trials. So, you know, that's actually a really good question um, from the point of view of there being an interaction. So would you, would it help the model to consider interactions between ancestry and the different um, labs? Because for example, African-American individuals tend to have a lower neutrophil count. And if neutrophils are an exclusion criteria, having low neutrophils, then you will be removing African-Americans who maybe with a lower count would still be, would still be okay. Yes. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, I think that, more, that kind of more fine-grained analysis of eligibility conditions based on genetic markers and ancestry would be super interesting. Um, love to explore that more going forward. Hi, James. Uh, great talk. So I have a question about the mobile dynamics part. So when you try to align the gene expression with the video data, so the gene expression is collected from a specific time point, right? But the video data could be across different time points. How would you integrate or align it? Would you select a specific, the same time point from the video data, or you are going to like impute the different time points on the gene expression data? Yeah, it's a good question. So the gene expression is collected no, we're doing single cell RNA sequencing on a population of microglia, right? And different microglia in that population would be at different, essentially, you know, different biological states or right? different time points along this all morphodynamics, right? So we are capturing a heterogeneous snapshot. So it is only taking at one snapshot, but that snapshot actually captures cells at the different heterogeneous states, right? Um, and that's what we're relying on is that, okay, so even the transcriptome, even though it's taking a one time shot, it, is, it, it captures the, the different, you know, at least it samples the different morpho, morphological states uh, sufficiently to be able to map onto or to represent the morphodynamic states. Yeah, are you mapping to just one screenshot of the video or all the like, all the- No, so for the morphodynamics, we're actually taking the entire videos. Okay, okay. Yeah, I guess, yeah, so that's also why we're pushing forward. We're going to do is more targeted, you know, picking of the cells at different interesting time points and then sequencing them to do the more high resolution matchings. But you can't sequence one cell for different time points, right? You can't collect gene expression at different time points, but you can sequence the, the same cell at different time points, right? Uh, that's right. We, we, yeah, we, yeah, we can only try to find the most interesting time point for each cell and then sequence them. Uh, thank you so much, James. I think we're at the top of the hour. Uh, really enjoyed your talk and uh, thanks again for presenting to us.
Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks for the great questions and discussions.